Well, I don't think we're going to have any running backs drafted on day one of the 2024 NFL draft. We'll be looking for day two and day three for that. We will definitely have a tight end drafted in the first day of the draft. That'll be Brock Bowers out of Georgia. Welcome, everybody. We are talking about those two positions, the prospects you need to know. And you know what? We're going to give you some hope for the running back class. We don't have a Bijan Robinson. We don't have a Jameer Gibbs. We have some good players, though. It is maybe, hopefully, not as bad as it has been represented. And we'll also find out if there's more than one tight end we need to know about, but at least we've got a potential stud. I'm Adam Azer. I got uh, Dave Richard, Jamie Eisenberg, and once again, Chris Trapasso, joining us here welcome back chris you had so much fun you were so great we had to bring you back for another episode and we're happy to have you how are you yeah i'm doing good and i appreciate that i i did i like met the bare minimum for what you need to do in one episode to get back to the second one so i'm, I'm very proud of myself for that <laughs> you did a lot better than that what are your <laughs> overall thoughts on the running back class so as just a draft analyst, I think it is right where running backs should be. Like I, I, I was wearing the shirt for the running back or for the wide receiver episode. Don't draft running backs in the first round. There's going to be a bunch that go from like end of the second to the fourth or fifth who are going to ultimately become good players in the NFL. I think that's the right value for running backs. So like you mentioned in the intro, it's not it, it hasn't been this highly lauded class like we've had the last couple of years. Um, but yes, I, I do still think that we will see feature backs, the good complimentary guys, the out of the backfield scat backs uh, picked later. It, it's a solid class. It's not great, but I don't think it's quite as bad as it's kind of made out to be the last couple months. Do you think if if uh, Jonathan Brooks was healthy, there'd be a little bit different feeling about him? Two, Yeah, two things. I think if Jonathan Brooks stayed healthy, and it sounds like counterintuitive, but if Trey Benson got more carries at Florida state and like was the bell cow and not getting 150 carries a season the last two years. Um, then I think we would be seeing like, Hey, these two are two maybe could sneak into the back end of the first or early second round picks. But because Benson was really in this running back committee at Florida state and obviously Brooks getting hurt relatively early in the season last year, I think that has kind of dampened the excitement of this wide receiver or this. Those, those are your one, two. Uh, no, they're not. But I think pers- like consensus, uh, those will probably be the first two off the board. Those are one. Well, one of them is number one. Trey Benson's number one. Jonathan Brooks is number five for Chris. And I am so excited about who he has number two. Because I I look at the guy like, I don't, I don't know what I'm missing here because I don't see this guy. Should I say Marshawn Lloyd? Marshawn Lloyd out of USC. I don't know why people aren't higher on him, but Chris is, so I'm excited about that. Brooks, Jamie mentioned, it's a big storyline. He tore his ACL in November. This is a guy who played for Texas behind B. John Robinson, behind Roshan Johnson, got his chance uh, with 187 carries, 25 catches in 11 games. He averaged 6.1 yards per carry, and Jonathan Brooks averaged 11.4 yards per catch. Um, So, yes, he does have that torn ACL. I encourage everyone to listen to what JJ Jack JJ Zachariason and Heath Cummings were talking about on the FFT Dynasty podcast last week about Brooks and some of these other guys. But let's say he didn't have the torn ACL. I mean, you, you kind of just mentioned where you think he could go late first, early second in that scenario. But I you know, is he that kind of prospect? I mean, is he is he a great prospect? Did he have a great season before he tore his ACL? Um, in my personal opinion, is I feel like he, he got maybe a little overrated because we're we were reaching for something in this running back class. But I don't know. Give me your thoughts. Like, is he better than, say, Zach Charbonnet to use another guy from last year? Oh, ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I think he's in the Charbonnet realm. I think he's a little bit more explosive than Charbonnet was. Um, and, and not to go against what I just said to Jamie and like Jamie's question, but it did kind of feel like, Adam, that we were kind of trying to find who this sparkling first round running back prospect was. And then it was, oh, he got hurt. So it's not Jonathan Brooks. Um, but I, I think he was pretty great. I don't think he was tremendous um but the receiving ability at his size yards after contact the elusiveness i thought he was he just kind of not emphatically checked all the boxes but he checked a lot of the boxes of a future feature back i think there are like three or four of those types again that will be picked later but probably where they should be picked in today's nfl that can be those bell cow running backs in the future I feel like there's something up with him, Chris, because in high okay. school, he scored 62 rushing touchdowns in one season. Whoa. was named Mr. Texas Football, or whatever it is, Mr. Football Texas, and didn't get a ton of offers hmm. to play outside of Texas. And 
now he's entering the draft and I, I just feel like there there should be more buzz about him because I love his receiving skills. Uh he kind of leans too heavily into being a cutback runner. I don't know what the top end speed is and whether or not teams are going to gravitate toward that, but I think he's a good three down player. And I think he can be a three down player in the NFL and could eventually, like once he gets over this knee, can be mm-hmm. a feature back in the NFL. Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. Uh, th- that I just don't know how high his ceiling is, but I think you're right. Like three down right. player, you're not going to take him off the field on third downs because he can't pass protector, he can't catch the football. Uh, I think if anything, and I've kind of, I've kind of gotten nitpicky with this, even though I, I usually gravitate toward the the late day two, day three running backs because again, that's where I think they ultimately should be picked. Um, who are elusive. I don't think he's like going to make a ton of defenders miss at the next level. Now you don't usually see that at six foot, 220 pounds like he is, but I think there are running backs in this class who are just more naturally elusive that can get more than what's blocked for them than Jonathan Brooks. Yeah. Uh, I I, I kind of see that. I kind of see it. Did you think his offensive line helped him out a ton too? I do. I think, you know, they spread it out there with Steve, with Steve Sarkeesian and the offensive line was pretty good. Christian Jones is going to get drafted their yep. left tackle in the top four rounds, most likely. So they do have at least one one NFL player there. There's a guy next year that's, um, which his name is eluding me right now, but who kind of has a lot of buzz in next yeah. year's draft. So I, I think the, the the offensive line was very good, and some of those cutback lanes were gigantic, and I think Trent Richardson would have seen those holes. Um, so it, oh. it was not – I was not expecting to throw a stray at Trent Richardson this morning. But, um, yeah, I think – in terms of just hitting big runs, it's great to see on film. And like you guys know, uh, that's great. But to be able to see, like, what can this runner do when it's not perfectly blocked, when there is a linebacker in the hole? Is he lowering his shoulder and trying to run through him? And that's usually not good for shelf life. Or can he make that guy miss or really not be squared up by the tackler? That's where I have a little bit of a concern with Jonathan Brooks. And maybe that's what you're saying, Dave, that there is something to him that he's not super elusive, just making guys miss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. He is, you know, highly regarded, but coming off the torn ACL, which again, he suffered in November. And uh, Jamie, we do have, I don't know if this is, I don't know how unique this is, but we have two really desirable spots, right? With Dallas and the chargers. Um, any other spots that really, and not necessarily just for Jonathan Brooks, but for anyone, but, but at least we've got that. If we don't have a, an elite running back uh, in this class, at least we've got some destinations that look good, right? Yeah, I mean, Dallas is clearly the most ideal because of what their backfield looks like. Uh, you know, you could throw the Giants in there just because I don't think Devin Singletary's, you know, solidified as a featured guy, but, you know, can, can do the job. Um you know, I put that as as a third spot. I think Minnesota, you know, knowing that Aaron Jones is 29 and, and missed a lot of time last year, that's another team I, I could see, you know, jumping into it. The Raiders, you know, moving on from Josh Jacobs. And, you know, no matter how much they say they like Zamir White, I, I would imagine they'd like to add somebody else there, not just Alexander Madison. So the, there's there's a few spots I think you could see where, you know, teams will, will maybe go a little bit sooner. You know, not necessarily disagreeing with Chris. I don't, I don't think we're going to see a, a round one running back and, and even early in round two. Mm-hmm. I think end of round two, round three makes a lot of yeah. sense for where the first couple of guys may go or at least one guy may go. Uh, but Dallas is definitely the team that we're going to be looking at and saying whoever they get is probably going to be the first running back drafted in fantasy, you know, depending on how high that goes. Uh, I would be surprised if it's not in the first five rounds just because, again, what that – team has produced as bad as you think Tony Pollard was. He was worth around five pick last year. We just overvalued him as around one pick in fantasy. So we'll see whoever they end up getting, but um, that's going to be, I think the, the, the team that we gravitate to the most of, okay, now they have their guy. Now let's see what this guy can do. But though that those aren't the only, I think Jamie named six teams. Like you can make the case for close to maybe 10 more teams that could use at least depth at the running back position. Some of them are pretty scary, and there's a couple of teams that have backs that we love. They've been huge for fantasy for years. There, there could be a changing of the guard after this year, some because of contract situations, some because they might just be over the hill. Right. But we're looking for, you know, obviously we're looking for a guy who can come in, step in, and be good in 2024. Right. And for that matter, I kind of hope Jonathan Brooks doesn't end up going to the Cowboys 
or the Chargers because I don't want to have to. De- well, he's coming off the torn ACL. We like everything yeah. about him. So mm-hmm. We don't know how he's going to right. That's going to be kind I of. I don't annoying. think he fits in with what the Chargers want from their running back. Oh, they're yeah. taking Blake Corum. It's done. <laughs> they want somebody like that. Blake Corum is small. I got to say that though. Like yes. Blake Corum is a is a guy who's a he's a really. This is my favorite Blake Corum stat. Um, near the goal line, I, I looked at uh, most of these guys how they did from one to three yards out. In his career, Blake Corum had 47 carries from one to three yards out. He scored 34 touchdowns Whoa. on those 47. Right? Is that amazing? That is incredible. <laughs> uh, I don't really know what a good rate is in college. We should definitely be over 50. percent But in the, I mean, that would be amazing in the NFL. In college, even that's that's three. That was by far the best I saw. There. There's a lot of carries too. 34 touchdowns on 47 carries near the goal line. But the problem is for a guy who wants to be a bruiser like Blake Corum. He's 5'8", 205 pounds. So I don't know if he fits the Chargers. I, I mean, I know it makes sense because the Michigan thing. But he's he's not Gus Edwards. Let's put it that way, Chris. And um, no. you know, i got to take a break but in, in, in mid-discussion here. But I do want to know your thoughts on on these smaller running backs, I guess, in general. you got Corum. Um, you got Bucky Irving, who's 192 pounds, 5'9". Uh, and just your thoughts, you know, can I help? Like Devon Achan, we, we don't even know what kind of pounding he can take. Can a smaller running back be an every down back? We'll talk about that in a moment. I do want to look to, uh, tell you about some other podcasts we have. We have the With the First Pick podcast, a great way to get ready for the NFL draft. You can hear uh, a former GM and very talented scouts now uh, talking NFL draft all the time. I love that podcast, and they have really fun banter on there as well. We've got the early edge for gambling. we got a new one, Beyond the Arc. we got the first cut. For you Masters fans, for for any golf fan out there, the first cut. We got Fantasy Baseball today. We got FFD Dynasty. CBSSports.com slash podcasts has it all. Quick break here. Thoughts on smaller running backs. Thoughts on the rest of this class. Thoughts on Brock Bowers and the tight ends right after this. We need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. Chris, is there a height, weight that you look for with running backs? So it always used to be 200 pounds. I I think you can go... A little under that, I think uh, Bucky Irving, it, like being in the 190s, is probably as light as you want to get. Now, that's, of course, talking like being a, a high volume type player. And I think it's, as you guys would know, it's it's if if someone is five eight and over 200 pounds, like Blake Corum, they're built lower to the ground. Their contact balance is just naturally better, so he's a thicker running back than Bucky Irving. Um, I just think in the modern day NFL, it's not exactly mirroring what we've seen at wide receiver, but. And I'm not saying that players aren't getting bigger and faster, but it seems like smaller, quicker players at those skill positions, like Sam Laporte is not very big. George Kittle is not very big. I don't think you need to be gigantic um, and be 225 plus to be a serviceable running back today. So I, I think it's it's that threshold has been dropped maybe five or 10 pounds. If you're at least 190 around 5'8", 5'9", 5'10", I think you can be. And you have good receiving ability, and you and you truly are good in space like Bucky Irving is. I think he really excels there. Uh, then I think that's fine. Uh, specifically with Corum, do you yeah. think – and I want to point out with Corum also, he was a lot better earlier in his career. I do wonder – Before the injury. Yeah, the torn meniscus late in 2022. He didn't have a great 2023 – um, which might be hurting his draft stock. Do you think he can hold up with his running style and his size, Blake Corum? So I just said that, you know, his his size I think is fine at 5'8", 205. I just don't think he's elusive enough, and I just mentioned it. Um, so what I've done with running backs, like since I've been here at CBS, like it's fun to watch these guys. You watch a ton of games, and you think, okay, I think this guy's this elusive, and I think this guy's that elusive. It's very hard because there's such a, like, small disparity between how elusive these guys are. So I really lean on the numbers. Uh, Blake Corum's missed tackle force rate was like in the high 20s at Michigan. Bucky Irving's the last two years was almost 40. So like that's way, way different. Jonathan Brooks was at 33.6% last year. His really his own his only one major year at Texas, 33.6%. Trey Benson, who we haven't talked about yet, 40%. 
Tyrone Tracy, who we haven't talked about yet, 40%. So like I, I lean more into those numbers to say, well, I can't really, you know, watching 200, 300 uh, carries for these guys, I can't really delineate between how elusive he is compared to that guy compared to that guy. So for me, it's not even about the size with Blake Corum. It's about the fact that I think at that size – to be like Jamie mentioned, maybe not a feature back like Devin Singletary, but be serviceable and be able to be a, a, a quality player, a decent fantasy guy in spots. You need to be like crazy elusive. So I, to your question, I don't think Blake Corum's style where he is more of a battering ram and was behind an off like awesome offensive line, a great running scheme. Unless he gets it in the NFL, I don't think he has just the natural physical ability and just, again, the natural elusiveness to kind of hold up in the NFL. And worth noting, you're low on him. You have him 10th. So yes. that's I think he's the most overrated probably in this class, just based on where he might go. Wow. Okay. Who's the most underrated? Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State. He um his missed tackle force rate, 34%. So right, I mean, of course, smaller school level, but right there with Jonathan Brooks, and he's like 6'1, 220. He's a big back. Uh, and you just watch those two on film. Watch Blake Corum who's tiny and, and more of a battering ram can make guys miss once in a while. And then watch South Dakota state, Isaiah Davis bigger and has like similar, if not more juice in his lower half than I think Blake Corum. And he could be probably picked sixth or seventh round and be a great runner in kind of that zone blocking scheme that we've seen from the Shanahan coaching tree. And I thought you were going to say Tyrone Tracy, who you have third. Oh so. yeah. Yeah, with that, he's kind of gotten a lot of buzz lately, though. So I, I don't know if I would consider him underrated because I know Emery Hunt likes him a lot. Um, a, a lot more people, Greg Cosell likes him quite a bit. He's older, but I don't think he's like super under the radar anymore. Uh, here, your first guy is Trey Benson. I want to ask mm -hmm. Jamie a question here about the profile of Trey Benson. Uh, certainly highlighted on our FFD Dynasty show. He is going to get a lot of Ken Walker comparisons, Jamie. He's a home run hitter. He's a big play threat, but he's also a negative play kind of guy, or it's almost like all or nothing, or has been with Trey Benson, uh, who's coming out of Florida State, and uh, another guy who transferred. But he is number one. He's uh, He ran a 4-3-8-40, which is almost identical to what Ken Walker ran. Do you have any... Uh, issues with that profile? Do you like that profile? Do you not care, basically, in terms of at least I'm not saying he's glued, he's stuck to being that, but coming in, he looks like a big play guy, but that's also going to give you a lot of negative plays or a lot of zero yards. I mean, I, I think what we see from players like this when they get with the wrong coaching staff is when they're always looking for the home run and they're not going north-south and they're not getting the three yards when it's third and two and those type of things get those guys in trouble. Mm. Then we start to see problems and go back. You, you mentioned Zach Charbonnet. What were the things we were nitpicking about Ken Walker after Charbonnet was drafted was, is this what Pete Carroll was sort of looking for was somebody to get that extra yard as opposed to looking for 15, you know, and, and was that something that was going to get Ken Walker in trouble? Now clearly it didn't. And maybe he adjusted his game and, you know, they sat him down and said, this is the things, these are the things you need to do. So you hope that if he can be that type of player, that he can also adjust his game to continue to grow and evolve and understand that sometimes I don't need to hit the home run, but when it's there, I have the ability to do it. You know, so YPC for life will be always something you look at and, and, and get excited about. Uh, but also sometimes when it's, you know, third and one and you get stuffed, can you get it again on fourth and one and get that yard? And, and that's what makes the difference when you stand on the field or coming off for the next guy. So I don't mind the profile, obviously, because you love home run ability and you love the uh, potential of a guy you could take a 50 yards on a carry and, and score. But obviously, he's got to be with the right coaching staff and, and right system that's going to support that and continue to feed him when he's struggling a little bit because he is looking for the home run because it doesn't always happen in the NFL. The, the, the game doesn't always transition the same way. Is, is he a feature back in the NFL? Because he wasn't at Florida State. Yeah, I don't really know why that happened uh, outside of maybe Mike Norvell that kind of liked to cycle through running backs um, when he was at Memphis. Uh, beyond that, I haven't been able, been able to really gather why he was not given like 200 or more carries. But now I like the fact that Trey Benson is coming in with 316 carries on his collegiate sure. career the last couple of years. So that's part of the reason why he's my running back one. 
I kind of view him right between Ken Walker and Brees Hall a few years ago. Now, Brees Hall was the opposite. He had so many carries at Iowa State, was super elusive, big, and then he tested a lot faster than I think people expected. We've seen those big plays when he's been able to be on the field with the Jets. Um, so I like the fact, obviously, that Trey Benson is coming in very low mileage, and he checks all those same boxes um, that I remember checking with Brees Hall. Fast, big, elusive. 2022, Trey Benson forced a missed tackle on – 51 percent of his carries which is astronomical oh, it's really, great yeah. yeah it's really really high so for the last two years like i said it was at right at 40 percent a little uh bit of a dip in effectiveness last year but for me trey benson the fact that he has in his career about as many carries as Brees hall got in one season at, at iowa state i really like that uh so in terms of can he be a feature back, I'm not sure why he wasn't at Florida State. But, yes, I do think he can be that guy that can shoulder the full workload in the NFL. And I got to say, that's one thing that's hard to predict just from a player's workload in college. Damian Pierce yeah. obviously comes to yeah, mind. Same thing. Yeah. Uh, but also Josh Jacobs. I mean, Josh Jacobs was a guy who mm -hmm. barely really didn't get a lot of work. And then I think in his first game, he got 20 carries in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, so that's a different beast, though. That Alabama backfield was just amazing. It's true, but I, but it's really up to the NFL coach and how they want to use the guy. And I, uh, last question about Benson, who is your number one guy? Um, he averaged over eleven yards per catch. Just watching some highlights, saw a few a few screen passes that he either took to the house or, or almost did. Really exciting stuff. Which also reminds me of Ken Walker. I wish they would use him more in the passing game because that's the kind of guy you want out in space. But they don't. So you have a great efficiency with Benson, but not a lot of catches. Do you think he's ever going to be a 40 catch guy in the NFL? I don't know about 40. I could maybe see 30. I, I I mean, that was a strength that I wrote in my scouting reports that, that he's certainly capable in this screen game. He's not going to run routes. Um, he has a really unique style in space. The Trey Benson six foot one, he runs kind of high. So you think, okay, he has bad contact balance. He's not going to be able to absorb hits and keep going but he's actually pretty good at taking those hits and, and kind of maintaining his balance. He does that in the screen game as well, where you think he's just going to be a North South guy, hit a couple cuts, make a few guys miss, and then he can hit, you know, a 30, 40 yard gain um, on a well-blocked screen. So I, I don't know if he'll ever be so good where coaches will feel like they need to feature him in the screen game, but he's certainly capable and does not have any issues with his hands. All right, I want to get uh, – got to go a little faster here so we can get to some guys. Marshawn Lloyd, I'm going to go two through four in your rankings because uh, number five is Jonathan Brooks out of Texas, who we've spoken about. is coming off a torn ACL. Marshawn Lloyd out of USC. Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue. I'm getting my prospects confused. That's the converted wide receiver, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so you don't get a lot of carries so far from Tyrone Tracy because he played mm -hmm. wide receiver basically one year as a running back at Purdue. And then Bucky Irving out of Oregon uh, at number four. So Lloyd two, Tracy three, Irving four. I would say Lloyd is a pretty – Marshawn Lloyd out of USC is a pretty polarizing prospect. Hmm. You have him too. Okay. I've seen him 10th. I think Emery's really high on him. Um, what do you like about him? Well, I guess what do you like about Lloyd, Tracy, Irving? How, you know, Talk about two okay. through four. Yeah, so what I like about Marshawn Lloyd is that he's young. He didn't get a bunch of carries at USC. So again, like Trey Benson, relatively low mileage. And to kind of frame and give perspective on all these numbers I'm throwing out with missed tackle force, uh, his highest season missed tackle force, and this is for Marshawn Lloyd from USC, 41% rate. So that, again, it's not Trey Benson 51%, but to be uh, where Trey Benson was this past season, which was 40%, to be right in that range – Shows that he's very elusive. I think his vision is good. Uh, certainly could be used in the screen game. Uh, I just think he's, he's one of those, like, can and will be a better pro if he's just utilized more, like we were talking about earlier um, with some other runners. I think that's kind of how I feel about Marshawn Lloyd. I think there's a lot of untapped potential. Bucky Irving's interesting because he tested really badly. We mentioned Devin Singletary earlier. He reminds me a lot of Devin Singletary, who was coming out of FAU 2019. Did not test uh, well at all, but was just crazy elusive. Bucky Irving's highest season of missed tackle force rate, almost 43%. He's just really hard to corral in space. Now, he's not going to break away. He's not going to be a Trey Benson 
or Brees Hall to hit a lot of big runs, but I think he will kind of do the opposite where it's third and two, looks like he's not going to get the first down. He'll duck under a tackle, get three yards. I think he's someone that likes Devin Singletary did it in Buffalo with the Bills. And then last season uh, in Houston can really garner the trust pretty quickly of the coaching staff because there's not going to be a lot of negative plays on film and will get more um, than what's blocked for him. But if you love athleticism, he's not a guy for you. So it'll be really interesting to see where he's ultimately picked because we know that draft position plays a pretty big factor, maybe not as much so with running backs as other positions. And then Tyrone Tracy, I think, I mean, it, he is definitely a wild card. And if a lot of people have him much lower, I get it. He's older. He's 24 years old, played wide receiver at Iowa, only has one season with over a hundred carries. So again, I like the low mileage. You can kind of look back to it's kind of where I'm likening him to Antonio Gibson when he was coming out of Memphis, where it was like he doesn't really even know which gap to run through at this point. He really was so new to the position. He still does. Tyrone Trace. Yeah, he still does. And that's true. But we did get what one and a half solid seasons from Antonio Gibson as a converted wide receiver. Um, That's kind of how I feel about Tyrone Tracy. Obviously, he can catch the football. Um, His uh, missed tackle force rate last year, right up 40%. So he's someone that uh, I saw. Sam Monson from PFF, I thought this was hilarious, tweeted that Tyrone Tracy runs like he's drunk. Like there are times where he makes a juke that just looks weird. It's like not like you see from other running backs. And I don't know if that's because he's just so new to the position where he just kind of like back jukes between the tackles, makes a linebacker miss, and then accelerates. He ran 4-4-4-4-8, had a 40-inch vertical, so the athleticism is there. Um it, I think he'll be picked later because of his age and how raw he is to the position. But again, I I lean heavily into the numbers with running backs. Good athlete. Love the receiving ability with Tyrone Tracy. And just the fact that despite being so unpolished and unrefined at the position, he made defenders miss on almost half of his runs last season at Purdue. Where do you have Jalen Wright? Uh, I think I'm at Six. Six. Yeah. He's someone that, that is a little lower in terms of elusiveness, but hitting home runs. I mean, he did have some pretty big lanes at Tennessee in that spread offense under Josh Heupel, but uh, he can hit like 40, 50, 60 yard touchdowns in the NFL. And it's a bigger back. I just don't see laterally in, in uh, short area quickness and elusiveness. I don't think it's to the level of any of these, uh, any of these other running backs that we've talked about. But again, behind the right offensive line or in a zone-based scheme that's just going to ask him to make one cut and go, I think that's where Jalen Wright could be really good. Jalen Wright out of Tennessee ran a 4.3840. Let me go back to to, uh, two through four, specifically uh, Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue and Bucky Irving out of Oregon. And these are guys that you should know they have pass catching ability. Obviously, we just talked about it. Tracy is the converted receiver. So even though Gibson hasn't been a great running back, he's kept himself relevant because obviously he can he can play on third down, he can catch passes. They're going to have to work on pass protection, I assume, with Tyrone Tracy. But Bucky Irving had 87 catches in his last two years uh, at at Oregon. So another guy who can do that. And Tracy, I'm curious to see if he goes a little bit higher than we think because he's been really good on special teams, and that mm-hmm. matters a lot more now with the new kickoff rules, even though they are temporary. So we'll see about that for Tyrone Tracy. Uh, Dave, you saw Marshawn Lloyd at the Senior Bowl. He's number yep. two for Chris. I'm smitten. Don't tell my wife, but I've fallen in love with Marshawn Lloyd. Ran a four-four-six. <laughs> What's she's? Yeah, she's fine with it. Um, transfer from South Carolina. Went to USC. The avoid rate is amazing, as Chris mentioned. Forty-one percent was second in the nation among 160 running backs with 100 or more carries. He was also fifth best in yards before contact per carry. 20th in yards after contact per carry. Um, problem with Lloyd, eight fumbles on 291 mm. carries. So that's a big red flag. Uh, I don't I don't think you were as impressed with, with Lloyd, if I remember, Dave. I, I think he's a good running back. He's going to have a role with the team, but I don't think he's got workhorse potential. I think he's he, – I, I think Chris nailed a lot of what Marshawn Lloyd is, and he was one of the better running backs at the Senior Bowl, no question about it. And I think he's got potential as a pass catcher. That's really where he made some great plays at the Senior Bowl. But for a guy who he's five nine and over two hundred pounds, so he's thick, but he doesn't play like it. He he he's not as physical. Um, 
you mentioned oh, the like him, three last year. What he's two twenty because he's two twenty and he just runs by people. He puts his foot in the dirt and he just whew, he's gone. I love that from a from a two hundred and twenty pound running back. No, that's great, but there's going to be times where he you know doesn't have that lane. Yeah, he doesn't have that opportunity, and he's not going to be powering through. You know, he's not doing what Blake Corum did at Michigan. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yep. So that's that's part of the problem. He's not pass pro ready. I don't know how ready he is to catch the ball. He had a great week catching it at the Senior Bowl. I don't know if that means he's going to do anything uh, in in the NFL. And he does have a track record of getting hurt. It goes back to high school. I I, I don't I don't know if we should overvalue him. But if he does go to a team like we talked about at the beginning of the show, where he could fall into a massive role early on, then yeah, I I, I kind of get it. I could see him having. I could see him if he gets a huge opportunity, not completely falling apart. But I also don't know how many teams that have those opportunities. What a compliment, Marshawn Lloyd, saying yes, he's the complete back for us. Let's go get him. Not completely falling apart. I like that. That's a that's a good floor. Um, all right, we'll take a break here on that note and uh, talk more. I guess uh, if we want to talk more about Jonathan Brooks or Jalen Wright, but we also have. Um, Braylon Allen, who's uh, a name to know, Dylan Lobby, who's going to be the pass catching specialist, uh, and more after this. Oh, and Brock the Bowers. Extension. What's that? The contract extension. Oh. Who? Devontae Smith. Oh, that just Ooh. happened. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I'm going to nice. save the news. We have a decent amount of news and notes. I'm going to save them for tomorrow's show because I don't think we'll be able to fit them. But we have to talk about Rasheed Rice. I mean, allegedly driving 119 miles per hour. And the Chiefs in position to draft a wide receiver in round one. You know, what does this all mean for Rasheed Rice? T. Higgins says he expects to play for the Bengals next season. Brandon Ayuk, he unfollowed the 49ers. Ooh. And if you get the contract extension, I think all of you at home, if your company is on social media, consider unfollowing them. It might mean a future contract extension for you. Or you <laughs> what does get- it mean when your company unfollows you? Yeah, that's never good. <laughs> you also could get fired, so don't do it if you're worried. Um, <laughs> And uh, note on the Titans' backfield. That we'll save that for tomorrow. All right, we'll be right back on Fantasy Football today. The best couch potatoes come from Pluto TV country. And these taters, they like all sorts of different things. Survivor Channel, Ink Master Channel. If it's got a spaceship in it, I'm probably watching it. Three channels dedicated to CSI. Whatever mood you're in, it's going to be easy watching. Back here with Chris Trapasso and Dave and Jamie. So Jonathan Brooks, we spent a lot of time on him. Early in the show, the the rankings are Benson for Chris Benson, one Marshawn Lloyd, Tyrone Tracy, Bucky Irving, two, three and four. Jonathan Brooks is five. Jalen Wright out of Tennessee is six. We briefly talked about him. Jamie, you brought him up. Is that somebody you like? I do. Yeah. I mean, he's young, you know, so we'll see, uh, you know, how that translates and how quickly, you know, he can acclimate to the NFL game. As as Chris said, you know, I think the right system will will clearly matter for him. But uh, his athletic profile, man, it's fun to watch that kid play. You know, so I'm, I'm excited to see where he ends up. But, uh, you know, for me, again, it, it all comes down to fit. You know, you could have best best, you know, prospect and he goes to the wrong team and, and he's ruined. And and the worst prospect, you know, like Dave was, you know, kind of poo-pooing, you know, uh, Lloyd a little bit, ends up in the right system, as Dave alluded to. You know, we're, we're going to be very excited about it. So, uh, but yeah, Jalen Wright is somebody I'm excited to see where he ends up. I guess that's a good question overall is, you know, how many running backs? I don't know if there's a great answer for this, Chris, but how many running backs are – if they end up in the right situation, they could be the number one running back uh, in this class for, um, for NFL mm-hmm. purposes, for fantasy purposes. Like, I don't know that you could necessarily say that about Ray Davis um, uh, or yeah, Dylan no. Lobby. He's such a specialist. Mm-hmm. But how many mm-hmm. running backs, if they go to the Cowboys, they are number one this but, year? For us uh, before Chris answers, let me just jump in on that real quick. Because sure. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is probably the, the perfect story for this. Is He wasn't really the best prospect in that class. And we got so excited because of the place that he ended up. He's with Andy Reid and the Chiefs. They spent a first-round pick on him. This can't fail. 55 catches coming out of LSU. Like, there was an opening. There was uh, a team that was, you know, almost perfect for what we thought was any running back. And he was terrible. You know, and so, not terrible, but he, he just, he, he wasn't, he didn't live up to the expectations. So, that's the thing, like, we want to avoid is... The, the prospect maybe being middle of the pack or near the top, but not necessarily the best. Cause Jonathan Taylor was the best that, that year mm-hmm. coming out. 
and ended up in a good situation, not the same ideal situation. We were saying he should be two. Edwards Alaire should be one. At least that was the, the consensus. And then we see how it worked out for both those guys. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Chris, but it, it feels like no. that's the, the story we're looking to avoid is who's for the sure. guy that just goes to the right spot but may not be the right player for that particular team, even though they thought he was, and we also followed suit. Huh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think Trey Benson, to me, Marshawn Lloyd, Dave doesn't agree, and that's fine. And Jonathan Brooks, and even Jalen Wright, those four, I think, are like they're immune to the situation that they land in. I mean, that's within reason. I think all four of those backs, they're going to probably be picked somewhere from late second, like Jamie mentioned, to the fourth round. The teams that pick them, I mean, that's a relatively early investment on a running back today. So I think those teams will have it, hopefully some plan in place or a need, or, you know, they want to play those running backs relatively early on and don't have abysmal offensive lines. I think any of those four um, in a reasonable situation can in the next two to three years be very fantasy relevant and be, you know, in the top, I don't know, 10 to 15 running backs in the NFL. And, you know, Dave, Dave mentioned this before about the the 10 teams or so outside of the ones I named that, that could be in the market for a running back and just adding to their depth. So, you know, we may be looking at these guys and saying, okay, yeah, if an injury happens, they're going to be good or, or, you know, this situation, that situation, whatever it is, mostly probably, probably injury when you're talking about the, the guy that the Ravens may invest in or the Cardinals may invest in or, you know, some of these teams that need Cleveland, have, you know, Cleveland or, mm. or the Texans, you know, just looking for yeah. their next guy. You know, that may be 2025 as opposed to 2024. Those are the ones that are going to be very interesting to see because they may surprise us. You know, Baltimore may surprise us. The Cardinals may surprise us. You know, teams like that have what should be their featured guy in place. But knowing that they're 27, 28, 29, obviously Derrick Henry 30, you know, those type of situations. And those are going to be the very, very intriguing ones, especially, you know, I'm, I'm sure Heath has, you know, talked about this at length. At least I hope he has uh, in terms of what those guys value is for 2025 and beyond. And when you're doing these rookie only mm -hmm. drafts, how much you're going to be investing in those guys maybe earlier than you think you might, or might, might want to because of what they could become by next season. You want the grossest team. This one's going to make fantasy managers sick. That could go and draft a running back. Jacksonville. Mm. Each ends in the contract year. Bigsby didn't step up last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would not be surprised if Jacksonville ended up getting. Well, it. I mean, it, it it does make a little bit of sense with Balky, you know, coming from San Francisco and and how that team has sort of operated for years, and being a part of it. Yeah, and they already right. I mean, they already said they wanted to reduce ETN's workload, and I think they may have may have drafted a dud last year in Bigsby. So uh, we'll see. Um, all right, Brooks and Jonathan Brooks is five. Jalen Wright is six. Let's go to seven, eight here. Uh, Kimani Vidal out of yes. Troy. It took me like you, you heard how slowly I had to go to pronounce the name. Kimani Vidal, uh, 5'8, 213 pound running back out of Troy, ran a 4.46 40 yard dash. Um, and then you've got at eight, you have Braylon Allen, who's just a big dude out of mm -hmm. Wisconsin, which I mean. You figured he would go to Wisconsin, right? So uh, oh, six one used to eight Wisconsin running backs. It was so funny. I mean, I don't like. I don't want a two hundred and thirty five pound running back who did not run the forty. That's just not my kind of guy <laughs> in the NFL these days. Like, I don't see any chance that Braylon Allen's going to be in on third downs. I, I just like this is oh, not free Melvin Gordon, right? Yeah, right. I mean, he he fits in with Ron Dane. You know, I mean, he's that's just that's not what the NFL is these days, really. So, I, I, I am I wrong, Chris? Like, Braylon Allen, I don't see him being hugely fantasy relevant. Um, probably, yeah, he is gigantic. He is one of the youngest running back or the youngest prospects in the entire class. He's only 20 years old. So, Jamie mentioned with Jalen Wright, who's also very young, like, is that good? Is that promising for what we were just talking about, like the, the future 2025 and beyond, or will it take him? a year or two to gain the trust of his coaching staff and kind of learn the intricacies that comes with the complexities of just running in the NFL, um, picking which lane to choose, things like that. What's interesting and what's a little different about Braylon Allen um, coming from Wisconsin outside of the fact that he's like as big as Ron Dane was, is that he is awesome in pass protection. So I know that's not fantasy relevant, but I think it will get him on the field 
on third downs relatively early. And it's usually the case you show early in your career as a running back that you're good in pass protection. Then eventually they'll start throwing you the football. Now he was not a huge part of the receiving game at Wisconsin, but I, I, I didn't see like he has like Andre Williams hands necessarily. I think he's actually can be good in that regard. And in terms of vision, being 6'2", 235, it feels like he's just a battering ram. I think he's very uh, good on those inside and outside zone plays where he can just hit one cut and then just kind of effortlessly run through someone. Now, he's not Derrick Henry, but I think his power is like effortless. He's not looking for contact, but he's just such a horse to bring to the turf. Um, and again, he's the best pass blocking uh, running back in this class. And I think Kamani Vidal from Troy is also kind of a fire hydrant, very good in that regard. So it's maybe good notes to have going into a rookie only draft that these guys might have that trust and confidence from their coaching staff early on because they're not total liabilities when it comes to pass protection. You, you can tell Chris has been describing players for a while now from the spinly from last week and horse <laughs> take it to the turf. Yeah. I, it's, it's all for my scouting reports. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I try to sound as scouty as possible in those. So it's just uh, Ray, out Raylan there. Allen sounds like a charger to me. Ooh. No, actually I think Don F nailed it. Sounds like a Packer to me. <laughs> not this year maybe I, but yeah i don't know man did, did they get out of that mold after aj Dillon burned him hmm. well i i look I, honestly i'm here to learn I, I didn't know about the pass protection so that's a great note and that'll give me a little more hope for him and the fact that he is only 20 years old braylon allen and he had 28 i, I, I want to bring up something chris said there though because uh it i know chris plays fantasy and and certainly for people that listen if you're good in pass protection it does make you a little fantasy relevant because it keeps you on the field yeah, exactly. no, so, yeah, for sure. Um, it's not a stat, obviously, that we that we track for points, but it does help certainly in, in how we evaluate those players because we'll say all the time, well, why is he coming off the field in certain situations? Because he can't pass ball. So, right. Uh, right. But yeah, I can see the Chargers taking a chance on someone like that because they don't need necessarily. We think they have a need. They may not think they have a need for this season because of what they've what what who they brought in and who they you know are, are continuing to look at. So it may be they're looking for more depth as opposed to a starter. I wonder if we right, add that to our leagues this year. P P P B. <laughs> you could do that. The the ones you commissioned. Point per pass block. Uh, how about Dylan Lobby? So another oh. small school guy here. Is he? Uh, oh, is he no. the best pass catcher in this class? He, uh, he, he, he insane amount of catches. He's kind of like Evan Hall at Northwestern last year, who caught like a million passes in that offense. He was really like the focal point of the New Hampshire offense last year. I tweeted just from a draft perspective, and because I do lean into the numbers so much that I don't understand, and just from watching the film, I don't know why a team would pick Blake Corum when you can just pick Dylan Lobby later. He's a better athlete. They're both older prospects around the same size. The missed tackle force rate, or like you're calling it, avoid rate was higher for Lobby. Now difference, of course, small school as opposed to the Big Ten. Um, but they're like very, very similar runners. Lobby was used like in, in short yarded situations too. I don't, he probably didn't score uh, you know, from one to three yards out at a rate that Blake Corum did. But if you want, if you love Blake Corum and you're not a fan of the Chargers and the Chargers pick Blake Corum in the fourth round, you should be circling that name, Dylan Lowby, later, f round five, round six, round seven, because I think he can just be that little annoying for defenses PPR monster um, if he falls into the right situation. And of course, is is it's not going to start as the feature back or even the running back too, but certainly caught a lot of passes, better athlete than you would think. He's a better athlete than Blake Corum. Um, he's just a little bit older and just doesn't have a lot of juice down the field. You're How do you feel about Blake Corum? Do you, do you like Blake Corum? <laughs> you are just, I love it, man. No, it's, I'm just kidding with you. Um, you have Corum, you call them the most underrated and uh, it just seems like it's very funny the way you kept kind of trashing him there, but no, you don't hate Blake Corum. I mean, you have him 10th. No, no, I don't. Yeah. I have him 10th. I don't hate him. I think, I mean, like I just said, if the chargers pick him in the fourth round, I think that's a little early for him. I think he can be in, in a very niche role. Fine. Do I think he's going to be this amazing short yardage goal line back in the NFL? I, I, I don't, I think, Michigan was so good up front and they really featured him in that role. I don't think, again, he's good enough getting down inside the goal line to be that person that gardeners those carries. 
I think if he went in the fifth or sixth, I think that would be totally fine. And and again, he can catch passes um, in the screen game. But I think Dylan Lowby can give you a lot of what Blake Corum gets. You can just pick him later in the draft. I got two more running backs to ask you about, and we'll see if the, the chat has any more uh, to ask you about. Right. But on a quick aside, Dave and Jamie, are you guys, do you think the Chargers are going to be good this year? Because I'm getting some just like they're going to suck vibes. No. Mm. No, I think they'll be competitive. I mean, they don't have a good defense. They have obvious needs that they need to fill in the draft. But right now they have, I would say, one of the worst starting running backs. They don't. They have the one of the worst receiving cores. They don't have an explosive tight end. What do they have? They have a great quarterback, so that always helps. But what do they have other than him? They Quarterback. I think they, Coach, it's, it could take him more than a year, though. You know, it could. It may not be a year. Well, I mean, I, mean you're, I don't know what you're defining as as winning. Are they going to the Super Bowl? No. Can they? Are be you, on are the they five hundred? Are they nine and eight or worse? I think they're below five hundred. I would say they're in that range. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree. All right, so we're not that I, far off. No, but I mean, I, I, you know, given the fact that you know the we're, what they're coming. First off, they just stay healthy. They're going to be competitive. That's been such a Achilles Which is kind of a thing that we can't guarantee with the sure. Chargers. <laughs> right. If Keenan, if Keenan Allen and Mike Williams can just stay healthy this year. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll just take uh, Justin Herbert staying healthy, and I think they'll be competitive. They're definitely going to be better coached this year than they were at any point over the last four years. Yes. They, they have Herbert. That's always going to help. Um, but they have a bare cupboard uh, it, offensively, I'd say. you know. But But they have a coach who gets it, though. That's the thing. Uh, all right, Ray Davis and Audric Estime. Davis out of Kentucky, Estime out of Notre Dame. Would you call them similar prospects? Uh, Estime is like the, this is going to sound weird, he's the less athletic version of A.J. Dillon. He is thick and big and wants to just run through people, did not test very well. I think he had one of the slowest, if not the slowest 40-yard dash, like in the four sevens. Um, but is like on film in terms of effortless power, I kind of use that phrase with Braylon Allen. It's even more so with Audric Estime. I'm out on Ray Davis. He's not a great athlete. The avoid rate was pretty low. He's older. He was certainly fun at Kentucky, but he's one you watch his film. Like I mentioned earlier, watching his film, I'm like, man, he's really elusive. Then I checked the numbers and I'm like, oh man, like the missed tackle force rate was like 25 last year. We're mentioning guys at the top that are in the 40s, Trey Benson in the 50s. I think if you're above 30, then you're pretty good just in terms of your highest season at that rate. So to me, they're different running backs. Ray Davis is smaller, compact, um, was good in that Kentucky offense. It kind of took a step back after Will Levis last season. But if you don't test very well, and so you don't have that athleticism to lean on, and to me, if you're not very elusive, plus you're older, that's usually going to be me being out on the player. So that's kind of how I feel about um Ray Davis estimate though did force. Let me see. I got it right here. 31% uh, avoid rate last season, despite being pretty darn slow and just a kind of an old school back. So for teams that want size and physicality that don't want pass protection, I guess with Braylon Allen, Audric estimate maybe later in the draft could be an option. Uh, one thing I like about estimate is in the fourth quarter, each of the last two years, he averaged 6.9 yards per carry. Yeah, That makes sense. That that, he looks like an offensive lineman running out. He's just, <laughs> it, his pads are huge. He just, he looks huge running out there. Audric Estimate at Notre Dame, probably not going to be a great uh, fantasy option, but could definitely ha have a role as a, as a bruiser, as a goal line guy, maybe. Um, all right. Uh, I think we had a question about Frank Gore Jr. Actually in our chat, if you want to talk about him and then we'll talk about tight ends. Yeah, I like Frank Gore Jr. He kind of reminds me of Kamani Vidal in that they were two smaller school-ish, like non-power five running backs that are not very tall, but they're compact. The avoid rate was good. Frank Gore's highest was right around 36%. So you certainly like that from him. Now, he does have a lot of mileage on his legs. They used him a lot there at Southern Miss the last four years. Um, he's someone, though, that fifth, sixth, seventh round in the right situation, he would be more of what Jamie was mentioning, that he would have to fall into – the right situation, a coach that believes in him, a good offensive line, and then maybe an injury or two in front of him. I think he's capable of being, you know, that spot starter for a couple of weeks fantasy wise that can be productive against some lesser defenses. Oh, guess what? We're talking about tight ends today. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> okay, two questions. How many fantasy relevant tight ends do you think we could have? And how many wide receivers should be drafted before Brock Bowers in the NFL draft? Okay, tight ends fantasy relevant. Uh, I'll say at most it's three. Brock Bowers, obviously. Uh, I like Ben Sinnott quite a bit from Kansas State. I think his route running ability, the yards after the catch that I mentioned like 50 times in the wide receiver episode, I think with Ben Sinnott is very good. Um, he's a big time athlete. Didn't run particularly fast, but the the vertical and the broad jump, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but they were really good. I remember at the combine, I think he had a 40 inch vertical. Um, and then Jaheim Bell reminds me a lot of Chiga Conquo, who I know hasn't been super fantasy relevant, but he's kind of that H back, throw him the ball underneath, will break tackles, like just throw guys off of him. Um, so really only those three. I, I don't like this tight end class very well. And then wide receivers in front of Bo Brock Bowers, probably three, just the big three. And I know I called it a big four last week, but probably just a Dunze, um, Marvin Harrison Jr. and a Malik Neighbors. And then I think somewhere in that pick 10 to pick 15 or 16 range is where we'll see Brock Bowers get drafted. Seems like the Colts just are dead set. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good one. How would you feel about that, Jamie? Colts taking Brock Bowers. Oh, I, I think it'd be good. You know, I mean, any anytime you can get uh, a young quarterback, a playmaker like this, it'll, it'll help. And and I think we sort of saw a very small sample size that Richardson as a passer was a lot better than we expected. So, you know, giving him targets that can that can play and play at this level, I, I think will be you know, relevant to him. Is he the best quarterback that he, he would end up with? Probably not. But, you know, could certainly be somebody that he grows with. And, you know, that would easily be the number two target getter on the team. You know, so we would love that situation, one or two in terms of targets. So. It would hurt Josh Downs. It would hurt whatever else they do on the outside, whether it's Alec Pierce or somebody else, and, and clearly be a little bit of a downgrade to Michael Pittman. But I think it would be fine. So what kind of a prospect is Brock Bowers? Tell us about him, and how does he compare to some other guys we've seen? I'll just say in the top 10, he has got a chance at that. Uh, but like Kyle Pitts, TJ Hawkinson, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about Bowers? I like him a lot. I mean, I, it is a shame that we didn't get to see him work out. Um, and I'm a big advocate for prospects of any kind that have shown for not just one season that they're really, really good. And, and especially those that have, have shown that at a young age. And from his freshman season on, Brock Bowers was like, all right, pencil him in. He's going to be a first rounder. We don't see a ton of first round tight ends anymore. Um, the yards after the catch, I think, are great. I think he's really good separating at underneath intermediate level and even down the field. Um, he is a little smaller. Like there was that picture that went viral of him standing next to Rob Gronkowski and they looked like tight end and like, I don't even like a running back, like looked way smaller. So he is in that sleeker kind of Sam Laporta build where he's like 6'3", 240, 245. He's not gigantic. I don't think he's going to be an amazing blocker, but in terms of just the nuance, the athleticism, and I think surprising power after the catch. I think Brock Bowers can be in the next couple of years, especially as we're kind of seeing a changing of the guard, Travis Kelsey getting up there in age, um, you know, a, a top five to seven receiving tight end in the NFL. He's very talented as a wide receiver. He makes some of the best catches you'll see in terms of just behind his back, back shoulder, uh, over his head, diving. He's got really, really reliable hands. And that was a big thing with Dalton Kincaid last year when he was a first round pick by the Bills. Dave, would you like him on the Jets? Would you like him with the Mets? Would you? Uh, got a little Dr. <laughs> Lucy there. <laughs> would you like Brock Bowers on the Jets? Uh, sure. I, I want him to go somewhere where, at worst, he's going to be number two in targets. Mm. But it would be yep. better if he went somewhere where he could have a shot of someday being number one on the team in targets. I, I think he's thick. Like we, he might not be tall, and obviously Gronk is like Hulk out there, but. Bowers is thick, and I think that the way that he was used at Georgia, especially toward the end of his time there, short area target, makes a play after the catch, and he's got the speed that's unique for his size. And mm -hmm. that's really where I think Bowers can win now. But I also there, – there's evidence of him winning further down the field. He just didn't get used that way as much as, as we'd like to see. I, I can think back to watching Dalton Kincaid play, and he was a seam monster. Like all the time, Utah was using him there. And I, I wish Bowers was used that way more. It doesn't mean that he can't be used that way more. And so we'll see where he goes and, and what team can get creative with him. It, you mentioned Indianapolis. I think that's a team that could get creative with Brock Bowers. Certainly could be number two on that team in targets. 
I think about Cincinnati a little bit too. I think it would be rough this year because they still have T Higgins, but what if he's the de facto replacement in that offense for T Higgins? Mm. That would be, first of all, it would be a, a crazy offense for Burrow. And second of all, like Bowers would eventually be huge volume, pass heavy offense, use downfield, can't be double teamed, would be absolutely insane. I would much rather him go to either of those situations than the Jets, who have long term question marks at quarterback. I have the seventh pick in a super flex dynasty draft. Bake burger, Jamie. And uh, he could be my pick. I think there'll be three receivers for sure. Caleb Williams for sure. J- Jaden Daniels. There'll be five. So I don't know who's going to go six. Drake May will go ahead and super flex. It depends on team need. If mm-hmm. Drake May goes to the Patriots, I don't know. Right. That's the other thing. If the team ahead of me doesn't have that has two quarterbacks. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think right. it's reasonable to take Bowers over Drake May even in super flex. Because obviously, if you look at May, I would call him polarizing at this point. Um, Bowers feels like more of a sure thing. But like, so did Kyle Pitts, though. Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, um, I, I I would say I would say that I feel more comfortable with the uh, with Bowers hitting than than any quarterback other than Caleb Williams. I mean, Jaden Daniels runs so much; it's going to be hard for him to be bad unless he just can't play like Justin Fields and loses his job. But uh, Bowers feels like a pretty safe pick. I can't imagine I'm taking it. I don't know. I can't imagine I'm taking a fourth wide receiver over him. No, like, I don't think you are. And that's the range. Well, it depends. Like, what does Buffalo do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Really. Even uh, that six and seven is where he's going to go in super flex. And he, I almost think you pencil him in for fourth overall in one QB rookie only drafts. Mm. Mm, I don't know. I think Caleb, I think maybe fifth. Caleb. Like you know, it, one again, QB, I think, I think it's, yeah. I I think there's no question it's Bowers ahead of any quarterback in one QB dynasty. It's a, unless unless you're a team that's picking fourth, you need a quarterback really bad, and you, and you drafted a tight end last year. I could see that happening. I hate where I'm picking. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need a quarterback? I maybe I have uh, I have Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson. I, when I drafted last year, I was like, oh, I am set for like eight years. But I've been trying to think of a trade oof. offer to make you for T. Higgins for Travis Etienne, but I can't find the right offer. Let's just do straight up. <laughs> That's fine. If you want to do it that way. He has Higgins. I have Etienne. Who would you rather have in Dynasty, Dave? Uh, I think I'd rather have Higgins. No. Oh, all right. All right, we'll see. Chris, thanks for hopping on, man. Sure, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Chris. Chris Chapasso, Jamie Eisenberg, Dave Richard, and we will be back on Wednesday. So Chris is a fire away. hydrant. Yeah. I am a fire hydrant. I'm, I'm, I'm small. I'm not over 200 pounds, so I can say that, but I'm definitely not six foot. Short, stocky, and the information comes out at a high, fast rate. <laughs> yeah, it does. There That's you go. A must in every neighborhood. <laughs> Dogs <laughs> love him. I know. What are some of his weaknesses? Stationary. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't move <laughs> Stiff very athlete. Well. Stiff athlete. Stiff athlete. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, well, anyway, thanks for, wa- uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Wednesday to give it a bit of an NFL spin to talk about the NFL players who could be most affected by the NFL draft. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you then.